today's lab has two parts. Both parts together will show you two of the many powerful ways in which you can use phylogenetic trees to answer questions of interest to evolutionary biologists, biogeographers, and other types of researchers. The first handout is on the biogeography of lizards. There are three species of lizards that are important for this study. They are shown here. There's Galodia stelenii, Galodia galodii, and Galodia atlantica. These three species of lizards are found on the Canary Islands, which are here off the northwest coast of Africa in the eastern Atlantic Ocean. If we zoom in, here are the islands where the lizards are found. Some islands are closer to Africa, some islands are farther away. So there is the linear relationship between the islands and the African mainland where the ancestor of the lizards are from or is from. Islands also vary in size from large to small. And there will also be a relationship uh, between island size, distance from the mainland, and the age of the islands. So pay attention for, to the information in the handout when you get to those questions because it's going to, you'll have to think about that information to make phylogenetic trees and to use the data. In the first handout, you will have to fill out this table, which is question five. You do not need to submit your answers to this table, but you need to complete the table so that you can complete the exercise. To do this table, you are going to compare DNA sequences and count the number of differences between pairs of species. You have to do every possible pairwise combination. For example, for you compare the DNA sequences between Galodia stelenii and Galodia atlantica, there are a total of 33 differences. You're also going to compare Galodia stelenii to Galodia galotii from the island of Palma, Galodia galotii from the island of Tenerife, Galodia galotii from the island of Gomera, and Galodia galotii for from the island of Hero. You'll repeat that process by comparing Galodia Atlantica to the four different island populations of Galodia Galoti. And you're going to continue that pairwise comparison until you have numbers for every one of these boxes. Once you have those numbers, and I'll show you how to get them in just a moment, once you have those numbers, Make sure you pay attention down here for eight. It's going to tell you how to basically round or use average values. So based on the, the numbers you calculate here, you're going to make little adjustments for your final values to use here. The last page of the handout has the DNA sequences. Everything, all sequences, are compared to Galodia stelenii. So the top line in each of these groups of rows, the top line is the DNA sequence for Galodia stelenii. You compare them by just looking down each column. So in this first column, for example, Galodia stelenii has a G. If, it, if the other DNA sequences have a period, that means they have the same nucleotide. So all of these begin with a G, and so there are no differences between them. If you look here, though, at the fifth position, Stellan I has a C, all the others have a T. So this is one difference between Stellan I and Atlantica, one difference between Stellan I and Galodi from Palma, and so on. Okay? If we come over to here, into the third group of columns, Stellanii has a T, Atlantica has a dot. So Stellanii and Atlantica have the same sequence. 
Stellani and Galodi from Palma have differences sequences. So that is one difference between the two, those two pairs. Okay. So that's what you need to do is to go through this entire sequence very carefully and sum up the number of differences for every pairwise combination. Again, Stellani to Atlantica, Stellani to Galodi from Palma, and so on. And then so you'll eventually end up, your final comparison will be Galodi from uh, the G Island, which I don't recall the name, and Galodi from the Island of Hero. So pay very careful attention. It doesn't matter if you are off by one or two, but you cannot be off by very much or you're not going to get the correct results. So if you are unsure, you can always contact your instructor and make sure that your instructor or make sure that you are on the right path. For the second handout, you are going to look at the role of two of behavior and of coloration as possible contributors to speciation in a group of fishes of coral reef fishes that are found around Florida, the Bahama Islands, and various places throughout the Caribbean Sea. These are fishes in the genus Alacatinus. These are a couple of representatives of the Gobi genus Alacatinus. One of the traits that you're going to be looking at is color. The trait can be either blue, can be yellow, or in some cases the stripe is white. So for color we're looking at this lateral stripe that runs the length of the body. So it'll be blue, yellow, or in some species it will be white. And this is a white one down here a little bit you see. There are three behaviors. There is hovering behavior where the species actually stay up in the water column. They sort of hover in the water column and they feed on plankton that drifts by on the ocean currents. Some species in this genus are cleaners and so they remove parasites from other fishes on the coral reef. So for example this fish right here, this goby, is removing parasites from this eel. The final behavior is sponge dwelling. So these are species that live inside these large tube sponges, which are found on coral reefs. And the sponge dwellers feed on parasites of the sponges. So there'll be tiny little parasitic worms in these sponges, and that's what the gobies feed on. So we have color, three different colors, blue, yellow, white, three different behaviors. You will be trying to figure out, your goal is to determine how many times did each color evolve, how many times did each behavior evolve, okay? So that's your goal for the second handout. To do that, you need to understand parsimony. You're going to apply parsimony, which basically the principle of parsimony seeks to find the lowest total number of changes among species on a phylogenetic tree. The idea is the fewest number of changes is most likely to be the correct solution. That's the basic principle of parsimony. The easiest solution is the best solution. As a side note, we know from all sorts of evolutionary studies that that is not necessarily true, but it will work for this exercise. So let me show you how to calculate the most parsimonious solution. We have here a hypothetical phylogenetic tree. We're going to assume for the moment that this blue square trait is the ancestral trait. So down here at the root of the tree, the ancestor of all of these taxa, A through H, no, actually A through J, the ancestral state was blue square. 
but we have this group of four taxa, H, J, I, and G, that have the yellow star trait. They no longer have blue squares. It is possible that the switch from blue square to yellow star occurred independently four different times. So it could have happened once on this branch leading to H. We could have had a separate independent change on this branch leading to taxon J. And same for the branches on for taxon, taxa I and G. So that would be four evolutionary changes. That is possible. But we can find a more parsimonious solution if we assume that the switch to yellow star occurred in the common ancestor of H and J. H and J retain the yellow star trait that evolved in their common ancestor. And then this could have happened independently in the common ancestor of I and G. And those two taxa retain the yellow star trait they inherited from their common ancestor. This is a more parsimonious solution because it requires only two changes. However, you might be ahead of me because we can reduce this down to a single evolutionary change from blue square to yellow star if we look if the change occurred in the common ancestor of all four of these taxa and so these taxa retain the yellow star trait that evolved just once in their common ancestor so we have a monophyletic group with a single evolutionary change this is the most parsimonious solution so that is going to be your job for this handout is to try to find the most parsimonious solution. In this example, we started with the assumption that blue square was the ancestral trait. But how would you determine what the ancestral trait might be? For our purposes, for this exercise, we're going to take a fairly straightforward, simplified approach. We're going to assume that the most common trait among all the species in the phylogeny is most likely going to be the ancestral trait. Here, this diagram will show you why. Let's assume for the moment that if blue square was the ancestral trait, one possibility would be three separate changes, three evolutionary changes from blue square to yellow star, right? That would be one possible change. I'm not showing all of the possibilities here, but one possibility is three changes. Another possibility would be two changes to from square to star. One here in the common ancestor of C, E, and B, then one in the common ancestor for this clade over here, which includes A, H, J, I, G, F, and D. However, if we had a change to yellow here, then we have to have a reversal, a change back to blue square on the lineage leading to taxon A. Right? That would be only make sense if that occurred in the common ancestor for all of these taxa. If we had the switch from blue square to yellow star, but A has blue square, so we would have had to have a reversal back to blue square. This also requires three changes, right? So in this case, this is the previous slide, one, two, three changes blue square in A has been retained from the common ancestor because the changes occurred elsewhere on the phylogeny. This solution also requires three changes. There's no way to say which one of these might be more correct. On the other hand, if we assume that yellow star is the ancestral state, 
the most common trait is the ancestral state. In this case, we only need a single evolutionary change to blue square. That's the more parsimonious solution. So for the purposes of this exercise, assume that the most common trait is going to be the ancestral trait.